Welcome to this episode of Consider It Blacklit. I am Kim Singleton, your host. And for those of you tuning in for the first time, Consider It Blacklit highlights films, television programs, and stage plays featuring African Americans up front and behind the scenes. We also discuss social issues as it relates to some of these programs and how they may or may not impact our communities. So thank you for tuning in and we hope you continue to tune in each week. Today, it is my pleasure and with great excitement to have this next guest. She is described by the New York Times as a one-of-a-kind performer who combines the sass of a classic blues mama with the skill of a Broadway star. She is currently playing Hermes in the Tony Award-winning musical, Town, and she is the first female to take on this role on Broadway. Everybody welcome Lilius White. Welcome, Lilius. Thank you. Thank you. So nice to meet you. When I saw Hades Town and saw you, you were just so wonderful. I was so excited when I found out you were coming on my show. That's all I could think about for the last few weeks. So thank you for being here. Oh but, my goodness. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Tell our audience, how, how young were you when you knew you wanted to perform? When I knew absolutely that I wanted to do theater, I've always wanted to perform. I've always been, you know, wanting to sing and dance. You know, when I was a little girl, I wanted to be a ballerina. But back then there were no black ballerinas, there were no black ballet schools. And uh, so I didn't get to pursue that uh, like I wanted to, but I was always singing around the house and, uh, there was always music going on in my house when I was a little girl, but when I knew I wanted to be in the theater was not until I was in my twenties. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So tell us what was your first professional performance? In other words, when did somebody start paying you to perform? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I did some, some gigs in college. I was in a group in college called the Demigods that was founded and directed by Joseph A. Walker, who won the Tony Award for the play, The River Niger. And he and his wife, Dottie Denro Walker, um, formed a group called the Demigods. And our credo was every singer is a dancer, is an actor. Every actor is a dancer, is a singer. And we were trained to be proficient in each of those areas. Um, so we did some gigs where we made a little money, mm. a little, little money. So did you feel <laughs> official then when you actually got like, what they call it today, some bag for your performance? <laughs> uh, no, I didn't really feel it. I didn't feel it because I didn't know what it was, you know, <laughs> until I did the Wiz Bus and Truck Tour. Mm. And uh, I, I, I did the, um, I started out as Dorothy Understudy on the Wiz Bus and Truck Tour. And then I, I eventually took over the role on the tour. And I, then I understood better about, you know, about the money. Mm, okay, okay. It was a good feeling to get that, that kind of paycheck. Yeah. Did you feel official then? Yes. Mm. Absolutely. Because awesome. I was in the union and yeah, it was good. Oh, when you're in the union, you know it's official. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes, definitely. Okay. So let's talk Hades Town. Yeah. How did you end up in that role? Well, um, I was uh, sitting at my dining room table with a very good friend of mine, Susan Davison. And we had just heard that Andre was leaving the show. And Susan said to me, you'd be great in that role. And I'd seen the show opening night and I was just, I love Andre, he's very dear to me. And I just thought, wow, that would be enormous shoes to fill, but it's a great role and you know, so I called my agent on the spot and my agent said, oh, that is a great idea. I'll call, you know, the people in Town and pitch it to them. And he pitched it to them and they thought it was a great idea. And so that's how I got to do the show. Oh, wow. Oh, in particular. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Now, you also are making history because yes. you're the first female to play this role on Broadway. Yes. What does that mean to you? Well, it means that I'm uh, telling the story from a different perspective than, than people had seen before. I am a mother and a grandmother. 
and I'm just kind of a mothering kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, people who know me will agree with that. Say, oh yeah, she's a mother. She's always, you know, taking care of somebody or trying to take care of somebody or something. So um, it, 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 it means that to me. It means that it's coming from a diff different perspective as far as being a female and being um, a mother and a grandmother. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're stepping in for Andre DeShields, who is just a legend in his own right. Um, what aspects of his performance did you study to prepare you for this role? I studied ma mainly how he speaks and how articulate he is. He's extremely articulate and, uh, and very clear. And I wanted to be very honest, very clear uh, about what I was saying in, in this role, because I believe that the words are so important and the way the show was written, there's so many important messages uh, to be delivered. And I think particularly at the end, um, they're very important words to be said. So I wanted to make sure that I was speaking the speech correctly and getting the words out there and getting the feeling out there. My favorite part is when you bust out of your jacket and you have this sequence on and you're like, I have arrived. And like the <laughs> audience just goes crazy. Yes. That, that is like my it's, favorite part. It's a favorite <laughs> moment of mine as well. Yeah. yeah. I love the costume. Oh yeah, so do I, so do I. Um, Broadway performing seems so grueling to me and um, I've seen it twice with you in it. How do you prepare to keep your energy up and bring your A game each time? I, um, I drink lots of water, spring water. I don't like processed water, you know? And, you know, we can only pray that the that we get the water we're getting that they're telling us the spring water is in fact spring water. But I drink a lot of water. Uh, I have certain teas that I take. I take a slew of vitamins and minerals and supplements to make sure that I have my energy level up. Um, I, I have some exercises that I do. Um, I try to stay as active as I can. You know, this is a lot to do. So I have some issues with my knees, it's, you know, rub some sap on my knees, ice my knees at night and <laughs> just generally take care. Uh, I still go to a vocal coach. Mm -hmm. I have a vocal coach, Susan Icorn Young, and I go to her on a regular just to check in and to make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm bringing it correctly so that I don't hurt anything. And um, I try to get as much silent time. I don't always get as much sleep as I want, but I try to be quiet for at least eight hours a night after the show. Right. So how many times a week do you have to perform? Is it five days a week, six days a week? Like how many? Eight shows a week, six days a week. Um, and then on the holidays, the, the schedule is altered so that sometimes we will be doing nine or 10 shows in a row without a day off. Uh, that's why I say the schedule is just grueling. It seems grueling. It's no joke. You know, Broadway, a lot of people who are in school and a lot of people who admire the arts say, I want to be on Broadway, but it's a lot. It's serious. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's a lot to do. That's why I have so much respect for you guys who Thank get you. up there and not only perform, but perform like at the top of your game. You know, yes. so yeah, hats off to you and congratulations. Thank you. It's important to me to give it my best shot each time because mm -hmm. each each audience, each show, eight times a week, you're going to have some people there who've never seen it before, never right. heard it before. And so I want to make sure that they get it. Mm -mm -mm, definitely. So um, Hadestown is an award-winning play, but you've had awards Prior to that, you won an NAACP Image Award, an OB Award. Tell us what you won them for and what that experience was like. Um, the OB Award was the, actually the first uh, big award that I received. And it was quite a few years ago uh, for a show that I did at the public called Romance in Hard Times. It's written by William Finn. And I played the role of Henny, a woman who was a, a, an ultimate optimist who had, you know, was living in hard times, uh, but she was still very hopeful. So I won the OB for that one. 
and the uh, NAACP awards. I have two of those and they were for my perform. One was for the Lifetime Achievement and one was for my role as Ma Rainey in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom at the Mark Taper Forum in LA. Um, and I'm very proud of them because um, the elders of my family, if they were all still here, would, would be over the moon that I received an NAACP award. It was, that kind of stuff was important in my family. You also have a Tony for your performance in The Life. Tell us about that. I have a Tony Award, Drama Desk Award, Outer Critic Circle Award, Friends of New York Theater Award for the role of Sonia in The Life. Yes. And uh, that was very special to me because it was a role that um, was written for me and a role that I originated you know, on Broadway. And uh, there's no way to thrill than that, than to have something written for you by people who are uh, substantially gifted and well-known. And um, it, and the, the role that the people, we weren't sure the people were gonna like this show, but um, it was a show about, you know, people caring about each other in, in hard times. And so uh, I had a great time being a, how do I put it? Uh, a woman of the night, you know, <laughs> and she was, uh, she was a house, <laughs> put it straight, you know, and, um, but I had a great time. I had wonderful music to sing and a fantastic cast and wonderful director and writers. And so I've been blessed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we've been blessed because we had the opportunity to see you perform. So you've done so much. Is there a play or a role that you would like to play that you haven't done yet? Uh, yes, there, there's a show called um, The Princess and the Black Eyed Pea. It was written by a friend of mine, Carol Foreman and, uh, and Andy Chuckerman. The original, uh, the original uh, show was written by those two. And it's... Uh, it's a great play with wonderful music. And I have imagined it with lavish costumes and a big set. It takes place in an African kingdom. And I would play Queen Zalba, the, the mother of the prince. And uh, she's very particular about who the prince is going to marry. And so it's, it's a great, great story. It's called The Princess and the Black Eyed Pea. I'd love to be able to see this in full production on Broadway. Um, uh, I wouldn't mind playing Auntie Mame. Mm, okay. Yeah, one of those classics. Um, I can definitely see you in Auntie Mame. You would tear that role up. I could do that. Yeah, yeah. I could do it. So, you know, and, and I love doing new works of art, new works in the theater that people have never seen before and bringing stories to people that they've never heard before. So um, I'm, I'm open to new stuff as well. I, lo I like creating a role. I like that. Mm -hmm. So um, as a successful woman of color, what advice would you give to young people just starting out? I would say, learn your craft, learn your craft, learn your craft go to school, learn how to sing, learn how to learn the acting. I was not good in school at acting. It was just really bad when I was starting out. In my opinion, I was awful because I didn't know how to focus. I didn't concentrate as well as I probably should have, but I had to learn that. And I think that the most important thing you can do for yourself is to, to be aware of your body. So you learn how to, to move well, learn how to move on stage, learn how to, um, to express yourself and really learn the craft. Uh, there are a lot of people who get acting roles on film and TV and some of them on the stage and they are not sufficiently prepared. And so it takes a moment. It takes a moment to learn how to sing correctly so that you can sustain the singing and to move correctly. Even if you don't wanna be a dancer, you should learn how to move, how, how to tap a little bit. And, you know, just how to, no, learn how to move on the stage, learn the craft, learn stage right, stage left, um, and uh, save your money. When you start making money, put some away. Um, be kind to people, um, you know, particularly your castmates 
and your stage managers and your crew, because there are times when your crew can save your life. Mm -hmm. You know, lots of things happen in the theater. There are lots of moving parts. And so it's important that you are familiar with all of those parts and, uh, and, and be, be kind to the people you're working with. Great advice, great advice. So I wanna talk about your studio album, Get Yourself Some Happy. I love that name. Tell our audience all about that. That album uh, is a work, a labor of love that was created by my friend, Timothy Graffin Reed um, and produced by my friend, Dr. Joshua Sherman. And uh, what we did was the three of us made a list of songs that we wanted to record. And so we each took from that list and we put together this album and we wanted to have an album full of songs that would uplift people. And this was before the pandemic was even a thought, uh, but we wanted to, to do songs that were, we were familiar with, that people would be familiar with, and songs that would make people, you know, rem reminisce maybe about happier times and, and just make them feel good and want to get up and move and dance and sing along. So that's how it came, up, came to be. Um, we went up to Vermont to the Old Mill Road Studios. It's a brand new state-of-the-art studios. Okay. And uh, we went up there and we just put everything down on piano. Um, and then about a year later, Timothy passed away. Hmm. Timothy was the musical director and arranger for most of it. Timothy passed away. And so we had to finish the album without him. Uh, so we did finish it, and uh, I'm I'm happy that we did it. Um, I hope that people will get it and enjoy it, and you know, get some some pleasure out of songs that are meant to uplift you and make you feel the love that came from it. Mm, yeah, well, it's amazing, amazing. So tell our audience. Um, where they can get information about you, your studio album, or what they could do if they want to keep up to date on what you're doing? Well, um, I usually put a lot of stuff on Facebook. Um, uh, I put some stuff on Twitter sometimes. I'm not that much into the social media, but if you go to liliuswhite.com, then you will see uh, where I'll be performing. Um, I'm getting ready to be in California at the Wallace Center the uh, first weekend of November. And then I'm going to be in Palm Springs at the Purple Room. Oh, wow. Palm Can Springs I go? <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. Come on. Just pack a suitcase. Let's go. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I'm going to be doing that. And then I'm working on another album. Yes. I have another album that is uh, it's pretty much finished. We just have some editing to do and some... Um, you know, some fixing and we fix up the album before it comes out. And it is called Divine Sass. And it's a tribute to Sarah Vaughn, who's one of my favorite singers of all time. And so we will be uh, having that for you, please God, at the beginning of the new year. We will have it all, at, you know, all fixed and, and mixed and, and have it for the people. So that's my next big project is the Sarah Vaughn piece. Um, and we're going to write a, a play that will go with the music. Mm. So that's, that's coming. But the first thing is the album. We're going to have the album out first. Mm, that's exciting. Yeah. And uh, the information will be on liliuswhite.com, correct? That's right. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, before I close out, do you have anything else you would like to add or anything you want to just say to the audience? I just want to say that, you know, Hades Town is a great show. I'm playing the role of a lifetime as Mrs. Hermes. And it is a show that your grandmother can come and see. You can bring your children, not too young kids, but you know, you can bring your, your 10 year old, your 12 year old, your old, your teenagers. It is, I think a family oriented show. It's a love story, but it's also a tragedy, but the music is exquisite. The set is magnificent. The actors are wonderful. We put something on your mind. 
Mm-hmm. And you see Haiti's talent. Would you say that? Yes, yes. I agree with everything you just said. It is an amazing show. Well, thank you again, Ms. Lilius White. And thank, thank you, you for Kim. You're welcome. It has been my pleasure. And thank you, audience, for tuning in. And until next time, consider yourself blacklit. Character Deputy Inspector Regina Haywood reminds me so much of the current police commissioner, um, Keyshawn Sewell in New York City. And the question is for both of you. One, have you met her? And two, what law enforcement um, people have you studied in order to make the components of this series so authentic? We'll start with Amanda. I have not met her, um, unfortunately, um, but I have had insight uh, through the communities in which I have lived in, that I spent COVID in. Um, I'm also from New York City. I've found that I've gotten a lot of perspective from people on the street and also um, people that I've reached out to in correspondence, um, which have been um, most helpful, but again, because of the climate, have chosen to remain um, confidential in in our discussion. So it's been very insightful with all the information that I've been given. Um, But again, we, um, I I know that that Mike and Billy have had quite a time with our wonderful writers and creating stories. And, um, and, uh, you know, we've just been really grounded in telling the truth and tapping into the human condition as best we can with the scripts that we've been given, which is just beautiful, beautiful storytelling. So we've been really focused on that. And then perspective as a civilian, as an American citizen, a great many of us are New Yorkers um, or have spent decades in New York as theater vets, Ruben Santiago Hudson and Richard Kind, Jim Smith. Um, so so we're, we're, I think, collectively picking from, from everything. Yeah, just to uh, just to jump on Amanda, what she was saying, I I also have not met the uh, current police commissioner, uh, haven't had the opportunity to meet her, uh, but I think you know a character like Regina Haywood, she's she's a uh, I would say she's an amalgamation of a variety of different leaders who we've seen throughout history, and you know uh, leaders who have been faced with adversity upon starting the position uh, with the with the caliber that she's uh, that she's taken on. Uh, you know, I've also drawn drawn uh, inspiration from the women in my life and and the women who I've uh, you know looked up to throughout history and and in my community as well to really understand where Regina Haywood is coming from in terms of how to you know engage with you know the community the members of the community you know she's she treats them as a human being first and foremost uh, and you know we get to see who she is as a as a human being you know, we strip away the layers. Uh, you know what? Why she's doing this job? Uh, what's compelling her to to uh, you know really thrive or try want to thrive in a community like Eastern New York? And so uh, you know we're just, we're we're still continuing to uh, to learn the character and and really understand you know what her her end goal is you know throughout this entire process. And you know if we're lucky enough, we'll we'll be able to uh, you know give that to the audiences. I, I found the series very interesting um, because it really reminded me of conversations um, that I have with my friends about hair. And one thing that I found is that we tend, my circle of friends tend to envy each other's hair. Like I have a friend who has your texture of hair. And at some point I would say, wow, I wish I had the hair because it was like a wash and wear hair. She soon corrected me, but I found out that she also envied my 4C hair because you know she felt it was thick, I could do more with it. So my question to you is, what black woman's hair do you admire that has a different texture from yours? And why do you think it's beautiful? You know, it's interesting. I discovered my own beauty um, in my own texture because of those with tighter textures. Um, and that was sort of my entrance way in to um, the possibility and the different styles I could wear. Um, and it was where I found a connection to my own legacy. I love Issa's hair um, and I love all the things that she does with her hair. I'm obsessed. I mean, I know these are people we interview, but maybe that's part of why we 
sort of entered in with them. But like Marseille, um, who I call Kayla, I'm always blown away by the different ways that she wears her hair. Cicely Tyson was one of my original, um, you know, the 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 artistry that she. Hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, close the non-video participants so that I can see you better because your team. Okay. Um, Cicely Tyson was one of the original women, the original um, sort of forgers of those incredible hairstyles. I've always been a lover of corners, but I don't know that there are specific people I, that I'm trying. Solange was one of the people that originally um, gave me courage, honestly, to wear my hair in different ways. Like I, I didn't see as much of that growing up. You know, it, when I was growing up, if I think of, I mean, I could name on my hand, you know, there was Cicely Tyson shoes before my time, um, but uh, Diane Carroll and all of them, they didn't wear their hair naturally in natural texture. So it was Nena Cherry, Radon Chong, um, Lisa Nicole Carson, Cree Summer, Lisa Bonet. Um, I mean, there, like there was a small handful of people that were wearing natural texture. So I didn't have like, all these different um, spaces to see. I had my family, but as a teenager, you're not looking to your family. Um, I mean, I remember people are like, did your mom, you know, help you love your hair? I'm like, yeah, but you don't want to do your hair like your mom. Like When you're a teenager, you're looking like out there, you know, trying to get the styles that you should be doing and all that. And I saw mostly straight hair. So as I've gotten older, now I see, and, and even now, honestly, social media is so amazing to me because I don't know if you follow, but I follow so many of these like um, black archives and the African archives one. And then there's one that's just like, it's called inheritance. And it's just incredible, the beauty of our hair and what it can do. And my hair can't always do those things. And I do, sometimes I'm like, I wish I could, you know, um, try different things that, uh, that uh, styles that I can't always do easily and naturally on my own. But I think that's also part of what we do within our community. I know it was talked about in the series, but this idea that, um, you know, oh, well, that looks beautiful on you, but I couldn't do that. You know, that won't work on my face. Like, oh, I wish I was a person who could shave my hair off or whatever those things are. And I feel like I, I hope that um, part of what we start to do more of within our community is be inspired by each other.